speaker is uh, Mohamed Sayed, so I would invite him to uh, go on the stage and uh, start his uh, presentation. He is uh, from uh, he is from here, which in Dutch is strange because it means he is from here. He, he, he lives here, but um, now he, he is um, uh, working for a company, I guess, called, called Here. Um, uh, by the way, uh, I'm not the one of the nerds, so I do want you to switch off your phones or put them to silence, please, because it's annoying for the speakers. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning. Um, so, yeah, I work for Here, which is Nokia's location in commerce. But I'm not here for here, I'm just here on my own. And uh, I put this uh, presentation together and I hope that you know, it will be a contribution to the community. Uh, so this is the agenda. And a couple of disclaimers, one you already heard and just one more. Uh, some goals and motives and a little bit of historical background definition of cloud computing so we can talk about the same thing uh, and some use cases for phosphor and and then I'll talk about AWS the components and service at a high level and if you want to be in the cloud what you're going to be doing and how you're going to be doing it um, and then some common fast tasks if you are building an SDI in the cloud uh, you're going to have to import some data, you're going to do some rendering, some geocoding, and so on. And then hopefully we'll have time for questions. So you heard the first one, I work for here. I'm a senior architect in the uh, core platform group for Nokia's location and commerce. Um, but uh, again, you know, this is just personal work, personal effort. Uh, I'm also not affiliated with AWS other than being a customer, so I use them when it makes sense. If somebody else makes more sense, I'll be using them, especially if they give me a better bang for the buck. This is still work in progress. I hope to be doing this once a month, or at least once a quarter. It, um, so your mileage might vary, but I've tried to document it as much as I could. So why did I want to do this? Well, yeah, I wanted to maybe validate some ideas with you, and maybe you can validate some ideas with me. I've done quite a few services in the in the past. Uh, I've worked for Yahoo before I went to Nokia, and so I also did www.yahoo.com uh, to borrow my Yahoo. Um, so I have a little bit of background in that area, and uh, maybe I get some feedback from you. And not you know, you would like to see me try. Uh, hopefully I'll, he I'll help you save some money. Uh, there was a lot of frustration while I was doing this, so hopefully you don't have to go through it. And there's already stuff that, some artifacts that are produced, so maybe you can use some of that. And in the process, you know, I've discovered some problems and issues, and, and maybe this is, maybe everybody knows about them. Uh, I'm not very strongly connected to the phosphor g community uh, although I've been an open source guy for a very long time so uh, I'd like to hear if somebody knows if there's work in progress to address the risks when we bring them up and, and why I wanted to do this uh, is basically because I think right now we are at a stage where everybody's talking about open data and geo and location and, and um, and I think this is a very good opportunity where you, you may be called upon to contribute either in your organization or in your community, in your university, um, using open source technologies, maybe save some taxpayers some dollars, um, and at the same time have some fun. So I think this is kind of uh, that my main motivation is that I think this is an opportunity where we can do some disruption with open source in the, in the geolocation space. And I, I think I can help a little bit. So a little bit of background. 
So cloud computing a couple of years ago was just a buzzword and was like, yeah, everybody's talking about this and, and it's, it's kind of emerged out of that stigma of being a buzzword into like a reality where people actually use it and they can deploy services to it. It, it had, it, you know, immensely lowered the, the, the bar for entry, the barrier to entry for startup companies, for um, uh, non-profit organization and so on. Uh, but this goes back a few years, maybe a little bit over a decade. So I think it all started with virtualization. I'm not going to go into the ancient history before VMware and virtualization on the x86. But VMware and Parallels used to ship uh, commercial products. And they had some customers, a lot of people used them in, in, in lab environments and so on. Um, but the, it wasn't massively adopted. Uh, Solaris, you know, back when Sun existed, they also did Solaris zones and containers. Uh, but it wasn't really till uh, Zen, and KVM, Zen before KVM came up and they, you know, they came with this power virtualization technique which really helped the performance and this became a very viable solution to run things um, in, in a production environment. And so that was, that was kind of like the disruption. I, I think Zen really, really tipped the, the scale here. Uh, at the same time, we were having problems with hardware, so we were not able to um, deliver any faster processors. We, problems with cooling, problems with power. Um, and you know, the, the solution from the hardware vendors was to, to go for multi-core. So you, have, you don't have faster processors, you just have more. Uh, so that was one thing. And then they caught on is that, uh, that if they wanted people to run things on multiple computer, you know, multiple uh, processors, the software at the time was not quite ready. So how, how do you utilize that? Um, so virtualization was a natural solution. And, but bef because of the performance it was still not quite up to snuff, um, the, you know, some hesitation was there and the hardware vendors started supporting virtualization into, into the chipset. So uh, first uh, AMD came up with nested page tables and, and then Intel did uh, extended page table where you can virtualize the, virtu the, 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 the page table so the virtual machine doesn't have to context switch all the time. Um, later on, there was I/O offloading, so TCP offloading, for example. Uh, you can just process things in the, in, the, in the NIC without having to go up to the main processor anymore. Uh, same thing for storage. Uh, and then the storage and network vendors started thinking about how could they support this from an infrastructure standpoint. So there was virtualization in the storage. They kind of called everything that they had done before virtualization, even if it wasn't really new. But volumes became virtual volumes, and, and slices became virtual slices, and so on. Um, but yes, so it, it started to gain momentum from there. And then uh, on, the, on the consumer side, we started seeing smartphones, tablets, and, and multi-screens, and people wanting to use services and be able to access the same thing from everywhere. Uh, so now it became the idea is that, okay, we don't want to really store things on desktops anymore. Maybe we store them on servers, but the servers have to be accessible. And this is where cloud computing kind of, you know, crystallized. AWS had really been pushing this for a long time, so they had really done a lot of work there. And they're uh, way ahead of everybody else, as far as I know, in terms of at least in breadth of coverage. Um, OpenStack is trying to catch on. Um, I think they do great work as well, but it's just, you know, they deliver software and there's n now there are companies which are trying to take the software and build infrastructure and services around it. So my definition of cloud computing, and this is just a definition, uh, it's a, you know, a computing paradigm where it's composed of uh, abstractions, uh, a set of primitives, and some interfaces and tools around them. And the idea is that you, you try to hide the physical stuff, the, the, the stuff that's hard to move, the stuff that you don't want to be tied to. So you want to abstract that as much as possible. Uh, and then you have a, a new set of primitives, some of them not necessarily very new, but images, for example, is a, is a primitive. Um, 
snapshots, volumes, uh, region, availability zones. They may have other terms for other providers, but they basically talk about the same thing. It's they're trying to abstract the data center or the, the actual computer or the actual hard disk away from you. And then tools, tools and, and uh, administrative utilities around that. Um, what happens is that once cloud computing kicked off and people started deploying virtual machines and cloud and, and so on, uh, things spiraled out of control really fast. I mean, and it wasn't in a very good shape to begin with. So uh, the, the tools and automation also really helped set that path. So Puppet, Chef, uh, any other configuration, CF Engine 3, any other configuration management. But the idea is that you, you have the primitives, you have the abstractions, and you have the tools to, to manage them. So this is kind of like a block diagram. So at, at the very bottom, you have the physical stuff. And then the, the primitives sit on top. And you have the tools and APIs uh, you know, at, at the highest level. We can even go further up. So if you look at things like Heroku, for example, they abstract even more where you just deploy to a platform. So you're very, very far away from everything else. You just have a command, you run it, you got a service. So this is kind of a clean representation of what it looks like. This is OpenStack implementation. Um, so there's quite a few errors going back and forth. And this is kind of what it looks like in real life. So this is the cloud computing. And that machine is very important because you know, if that gets unplugged, the whole thing goes to shit. All right, so AWS as a, as a public cloud. So the, the same kind of diagram, but will just be a little bit more specific. So we talk about compute uh, as an EC2 instances storages. Um, so compute EC2 instances is just virtual machines. They have a preset, predefined set of configuration. So you cannot change or tweak the CPU or memory settings. You can just choose one of the models. You can attach drives as you wish. Uh, then a set of storage. So S3 is like a storage over HTTP or HTTPS. And they have uh, elastic um, block storage, which is kind of a, a NAS or a SAN uh, idea. And glass here is kind of a long-term archival. Um, you have the foundation, you know, the, the regions, the actual brick and mortar. Uh, implementation, the data centers, the power, the cooling, all the stuff that we don't want to think about. Um, and the, uh, networking, so Route 53 is a DNS service, uh, lo elastic load balancing, CloudFront is a caching service, and a uh, set of tools around security, so identity management, security groups. You go up one level, you see the simple queuing service, or search as a service, or Redshift, which is PostgreSQL. Uh, and storage kind of so you can if you don't want to run a cluster and you don't want to manage it then they will do it for you and you just put your schema you connect to it and you treat it just like a postgres or a postgre unfortunately at the moment they don't uh, support spatial so it's only postgres and there's more there's simple email service simple notification service and so on uh, and the management layer is the apis the auto scale the cloud formation opsworks uh, you know, that configuration management and so on. So what kind of use cases we can do with phosphor gene for, uh, in the cloud? Uh, well, for starter, disaster recovery backup. So it's very simple, very easy to just dump a tarball or um, archive your data or a SQL dump, encrypt it, ship it over into an S3 bucket, um, get it back when you need it. Hopefully you never need it. Um, and th so this is a very straightforward use case. The other use case is a static logic free web publishing. So if you just have some vector data or raster data or any kind of static data where you're not doing any, any logic, you know, anybody who can make a request can get back that response. Um, you, you can just publish this using S3 and, uh, and CloudFront. Uh, I'll show an example, a, a diagram. Uh, you don't have to run a web a server. You don't have to run load balancers. You don't have to do anything. You just, you just publish it. 
and you will pay for the requests as they come in, but you don't, you're not going to have to maintain any infrastructure. Uh, uh, obviously, online phosphor G, so you can do geocoding or, or tiling or um, you know, routing and, and so on. So any of any of the software that is available to us under a public license, you can just run it. Um, if you run a GPL license in software, you, know, you have to make sure that you know this you're complying with that license. Uh, data data transformation jobs. If you have a set of you know tiles or a set of data and you want to just transform them from one format to another, or maybe you have four or five different formats and you have to do this overnight, uh, and you, you don't need to buy a whole bunch of machines and, and just have them sit for the rest of the day, so you can just fire a job, get it done, and, and shut them back. Uh, content curation, batch processes, so if you, again, the same kind of concept, if you have, uh, if you're collaborating with other people and you want to have some central storage where they can upload their files and maybe you can do some processing, put it back, uh, and so on. So this is like a blueprint if you wanted to do this uh, static logic-free content using AWS. Uh, this is your content and you can just put it to this S3 bucket. You can configure a CloudFront distribution which will point to this bucket and you publish it and you make your DNS scene alias to this zone that you are going to configure here. Uh, and that's it. And now users will go request your, your data. They will get seen into the CloudFront uh, zone. And based on some telemetry and some other magic, they will get routed to the closest cache edge to them. Um, if you want to have logs, you can also configure logs to go to an S3 bucket where you can just retrieve them back later. So how do you build it? How do you, if you wanted to do this maybe for a university or for a, or a district or uh, just your company, how do you do that? <coughs> so I think there are some architectural patterns and you'll not see this in books that kind of came up with this overnight <laughs> and uh, and I just wanted to share them with you so you're aware of them they, they fit some things better than others um, it, sometimes you have to mix them everything in the world is almost polyglot so you know, this, this is not uh, a holy book so the cookie cutter so the cookie cutter the idea is that you have a machine and the machine has everything that you would need and you just manufacture them. You just have 10, 20, 100, as many as you need, or as little as you need. Uh, they have everything together, so they have the application and they have the data. And they scale horizontally, so if the traffic is actually growing, then you can just scale up. If the traffic is, is dying down or, or uh, on, a, on a low point, you can just shrink them. Uh, the data is accessible to the machine itself. They are not connected to each other in any way. So they, they so if in case they fail, they actually you know the the failure is localized. Um, so very very simple. Uh, scales very well in some use cases. Uh, so it, simplicity is one of the pros, and uh, it scales horizontally with load and localized failure impact. These are very you know, the main points. Uh, problems is that poor support for write-oriented service. If you look at here, if you have so many machines and everyone has a copy of the data and the data has to change, then you have to push this back somewhere, somehow. And, and if, the, if the users are allowed to, to change the data, that's even worse because now one machine is going to change and it's going to have to replicate that. And, um, that doesn't work very well. Uh, it's a it's a coarse grain scalability. So when you scale, you scale everything, or you shrink everything. So if you actually have a service where your data layer is very very fast, but your web service is not so fast, so you need more web service or web applications. But you, you can't do it. You're going to have to scale the whole thing together. So it's a cookie cutter. Um, the node capacity has vertical scalability issues. So if you have if your data is growing, or if your uh, memory consumption is growing, 
you're gonna you're, you're gonna hit a ceiling at some point where you can't just grow anymore within that box. Um, so th this uh, there is a vertical ceiling on how how much you can process per node. Then there's the centrist approach, and the centrist approach is that basically you take the data out and you let the application run on the nodes. Uh, you can have a second copy of the data uh, as, a, as a backup disaster recovery. Uh, and this is, you know, the, now the data is centralized in this database. These are, your, these are the clients of this. And then the users out there, they are the client of your web service. Works okay in a lot of cases. Uh, scales well to for you know mid yeah, mid level kind of load. So if you're doing 20, 30, 40 requests per second or so, it probably works. Um, but has some other issues. So So the, the pros first, you know, you can actually scale the web service by itself or you can scale the database by itself. And uh, that's, a, yeah, that, that's a big advantage over the other uh, approach. Five minutes. Okay, I'm going to have to run with, uh, with the slides. Uh, so the replicator, the master of colonies where you can have masters of masters of records distributed all over the world um, and they can replicate to each other as read only slaves and, and this you know the, that works pretty good um, for uh, read scalability uh, you're gonna have to do some culture changes you know there's a, a, your release engineering this has to be in really good shape you have to adopt automation you really need to think about agility uh, you need to think about using the primitives that are, uh, that are available to you. Uh, you need to make sure that you get a buy-in from the stakeholders. These are very, very key things. Some process changes. Uh, and some of the things that you have to remember, the legal implications. Uh, don't try to scale in the cloud the, as you would in, in a, a brick and mortar situation. So don't try to go for a let's cluster these machines together and have big cluster and four or five cluster it just things fail and just plan for it and it's okay and just think about how you could recover as fast as possible um, it may take one or two tries you probably get it right on the third time but uh, the, the old approach you know trying to to connect things and make sure they are going to be reliable it, it doesn't work very well in real world um, I did some other work in this process. I'll go through it really quick. Um, when I started, I wanted to, to see if I, I can profile uh, you know, a renderer, a geocoder, uh, a router in, in, the, in the cloud. Um, and then I hit the first problem. How I wanted to get data in. And then I started reading about people taking 10 days to get the OSM data set. And I thought that was horrible. And uh, I didn't want to to get a, a synthetic data set with 200 megs and say, yeah, this works and come and show it to you here. So I really wanted to get the OSM data in, and I did. Um, so first I did some, uh, some tests. I looked at a bunch of countries, small countries. Um, this is uh, the time it took in seconds versus the size of the data set. So up to 3.2 gigs, we are within a 30 minutes or 35 minutes range. Um, I started collecting some stats around this, um, and I provisioned different infrastructure. So I looked at a local drive, how long it took. I looked at a uh, provision IOPS, which guarantees the IOPS uh, performance. Uh, I looked at SSD, which is very expensive. And so guess how long it took. I, I went with the SSD one uh, because I wanted to finish as fast as possible. Any guesses how long it took? Ah, you are an hour. I wish it took 35 hours, <laughs> but this is 250 gig. Uh, this is not so bad because a lot of people spend six or seven days to get this done. So this is actually not so bad at all. 
Um, but guess what I did after I just finished this? No, I made a copy. <laughs> so I made a copy. I built a RAID 0 set over uh, provision IOPS, and I created a logical volume on top, and I kicked off a data copy. Uh, guess how long that took? Oh, it's short. OK, it took two and a half hours. So I actually, well, this is a file system copy, right? So I just shut down the database, and then I copy the volume over. And, and then I archive it, of course. And this took two and a half hours. So this is what it took to, um, to do a provision IOPS to SSD. It took five and a half hours. To do a SQL dump to SSD took about seven hours. SSD to provision IOPS took two and a half hours. SSD to SQL dump took four and a half hours. OSM to PG SQL to SSD took 35 hours. So guess where the problem is? <laughs> so this is a profile of OSM to PG SQL. Uh, you can see the RAM cache nodes get 15%, while match 10%, copy to table 10%. So there's a lot of things going on before the data actually is stored in the database. And this is this is part of the problem, and you know I wanted to talk about that a little bit more. Um, so you can read these notes later. Um, when I did some profiling with um, with Mattel and Macnick, one thread, three thread. So if you run with four threads, you're gonna. If you run with four rendering threads, you get you actually get six threads. Uh, so two threads do like bookkeeping, four threads do like actual work. Um, you, you're gonna have to read this. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to run to the Geo Server part a little bit. So Geo Server single layer. I took a, com a small country called Finland and uh, zoom level 15 from zero to f from one to 15 and, and this I did a round disk and this this is about 100 tiles per second you can do about 100 tiles per second in that kind of setup and this is kind of a ceiling because this is RAM disk so it's not going to get any faster well it could but it would be very expensive uh, truncation is very slow so don't don't truncate your dual web cache um, try to publish your data uh, as version data, as version layers. This is this is much better um, if you can help it. Standalone GWeb cache will work a lot better. Uh, so try to think about just t yanking that GW cache out and uh, put some GWeb servers behind it. I'll uh, show you a blueprint. There's some possible race conditions in thread writing tiles. Um, and this is this is kind of an example deployment where you can take the GWeb cache out and you put Geo servers behind them and you put a load balancer that can do URL persistence. So these nodes are not coherent; they are incoherent by design. The idea is that you you will go to the node that has the tile. If there is no node that has a tile, one will get selected and then it will then from there on it will be persistent. And you can mix the disks, so you can mix a fast disk and a slow disk in a volume. And that would probably give you a very good performance. How much did all this cost? $866 and uh, two weeks. And then I have a backlog, release snapshots uh, to the public. So I actually have the data now in AWS. I'm going to make it public, so you can just import it. Um, it should hopefully help out. And I wanted to do some geocoding geo profiling and OSM profiling. And I'm open to suggestions as well. Thank you very much. So we we'll, uh, took off uh, all of your time. So I'm afraid we don't have time for, for any questions anymore. Okay. But um, uh, I'm sure your, your, your uh, slides will go up on the ELO Geo platform. All the